Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road as we continue our series through Jesus' parables. And to help me do that today is the one, the only, Shirley Woods from the old <laughs> Wilson Center. Shirley, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I hear all the time from people, she is so insightful. And I said, oh, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> oh, my goodness, she oh. is filled with the Holy Spirit. You're an amazing lady. Thank you. Uh, speaking of that, Bishop. Kelly Bird. Speaking of what? I'm <laughs> being filled with the Holy oh, okay. Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about an amazing lady. Right? <laughs> Thank you for being it's here. It's good to be here. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And Curtis Smith, Chief Meteorologist. Thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely, Mitch. Great uh, to be here. You, you're an amazing dude. <laughs> I you're, don't know if that's true. Oh, it's awesome. You're in one of the highest profile positions in our community, and you have an unbelievable platform that you're using to allow God to work through you, Absolutely. just relationally. I mean, it's not, it doesn't feel, um, I guess for lack of a better term, religious or legalistic. Not, it just feels so authentic and relational. And well, I really appreciate it. Uh, well, thanks. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, today, we want to go through, I think, one of the coolest parables Jesus told, and it's the parable of the sower. Um, and it brought to my mind my grandfather, Grandpa Russell, who you knew, um, he was farming when he was probably in his 20s. And his brother, they were always going to be partners in business together, and they were farming together, was on a combine with him, his younger brother, Harold. And Harold, uh, unknown to Grandpa Russell, jumped off the combine to chase a rabbit, and he was going to catch it. And uh, uh, probably a minute later, Grandpa Russell hits something with his combine, and it stops. And he rushes out to the front, and he had hit his younger brother, Harold. Um, and he knew it was bad by what he'd been taught, uh, by what he saw. So Harold goes to the hospital, and back then you know you're not there quickly, um, and he makes a full recovery, and he actually has a, a softball glove and a softball, and uh, Grandpa Russell had that till the day he died, and he was throwing it in his mitt, and he said, tomorrow I get to go home, Rusty. Mm -hmm. He called Russell Rusty. And uh, that next day, he didn't get the medication that he needed, and um, he, I think, had a blood clot that went to his brain, and he died. Mm -hmm. That circumstance, I know by conversations, I know by life with him, affected my grandfather's heart for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And with some of the choices uh, that he made, I think people... Um, thought that he might not look like what somebody surrendered to Christ looks like. But there were different conditions in his heart where this would come up again. And he just struggled with it his whole life. And I'd want to ask each of you, can you recall an experience like that? It doesn't have to be exactly like that, but can you recall an experience that has hardened your heart toward God? The event seemed to put an obstacle in your inner being that continually... Um, hindered or hinders the movement of God in a particular area of your life. And Jesus, I believe, addressed this scenario when he shared the story known as the parable of the sower. And it must be a significant one because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all include it in their Gospels. And it's a three-pointer. We're going to see that the sower sows a seed, that there's three unfruitful soils that produce destruction, and one fruitful soil that produces life. Um, but I want to go back to that question. Is there an experience, and it can even be minor, can even be something that happened in a day and you let go of it in a day. But has there been an experience in your life that, that hardened your heart a little bit toward God because you just didn't understand? My mom and dad's marriage, you know, just dissolving and all that came with that and all that was before it. And um, realizing it wasn't good when I was, you know, a kid and then in high school watching it just implode. Um, that was very... Very confusing. And he had been a pastor, uh, even complicates it. Yeah. 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 For me, I can't think of anything that uh, caused me to be, my heart to be hardened towards him. Uh, my personality is if something goes wrong, I question what did I do wrong? 
Mm. So it was never what did, you know, if God did something wrong or if God uh, was angry at me. It was more, what did I do to cause it? So I always went inward more than looking upward to see or to be hard, my heart to be hard towards him. I'd like to explore that a little bit. Um, when you lost your son, you old to adult SIDS, mm -hmm. uh, how old was he? Nin 19. 19. Um, did you do that then as well? You didn't feel like you were hardening your heart toward God at all or blaming him, but you started looking at, you know, other circumstances? Well, I guess I can, I can say this now. Um, no, it, not then either, because because of my relationship with God, and I haven't talked about this very much, but I actually knew it was gonna happen before it happened. Mm. So when it happened, uh, I just had to just let God really carry me through it. Uh, probably a year before it happened, we had, God and I had a conversation and he, I knew it was going to happen. You didn't know how or why, but you no. felt like God was going to take your son to the other side? I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know why. I just knew that it was going to happen. So when the police came and knocked on my door, um, I knew that time had came. And um, it was like, this is it. Uh, when they knocked on the door, my front door, and they came in and they asked if I knew you, Wilson, and, and I said, yeah, uh, and, and then I said, just a minute. I walked out the back door and stopped walking down the alley uh, where I lived because I didn't want to hear it yet, but I knew the time had come, uh, and I haven't shared that with very many people, but I guess I have now. <laughs> wow, Shirley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a journey of faith. My goodness. Curtis, have you ever had anything? You, you've had, we've talked about it before. You've, you've not really incurred much tragedy in your life at this point, right? Uh, no, in fact, when Shirley was starting, I was thinking, oh good, Shirley and I are in the same boat. We haven't had much uh, difficulty. And it turns out Shirley just handles it very well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm worried about this for the second half of my life, essentially. I have had very little uh, go wrong around me. I've had very little death um, to experience. I still have two grandmothers who are alive, um, who will be both be 100 here in the next wow. couple of years if they... Really? Yeah. You're going to be a weatherman for a very long time. <laughs> I know. I, I worry about that, too. I uh, think, gosh, do I want to live to be 100? <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, by 80, 85, I may want to get to heaven. Um, <laughs> Kelly, you want to imitate him as a weatherman when he's 100? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you look like you have a full head of hair at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> yes, weird. you will. Yeah, I just have had very little of that, and I, I do worry about it. I've had absolutely no reason to ever harden my heart to God, and so I hope that uh, this first half of my life essentially has prepared me for it and mm -hmm. that I can emulate Shirley's attitude mm -hmm. and never have a hardened heart yeah. towards him and to be open to his will no matter what that looks like, yeah. which... Sounds kind of easy until so you hear that kind of experience. Yes. That doesn't sound easy. Right. Not at all. I, I think it um, is emblematic, though, of how we have to trust in the Holy Spirit in us. On our own, we're not going to accomplish much, and we're not going to be able to do any of this. Uh, but it's, it's the concept that the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit and dwelling in a believer that's just incredible. Curtis, could you read, uh, we're going to see the sower sows the seed, Matthew 13, 1 through 3, and we'll just walk through the parable. Uh, step at a time. That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. Uh, the sower is Christ. The seed is the word of God. We learned that in Luke's account in 811. And this is the expression of God in Christ to each one of us. The soils represent four preparations of the heart. Three unfruitful, 
uh, which are destructive to the expression of God, one fruitful soil that experiences life. And the three destructive soils comprise three differing levels of obstacles. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I found interesting is that 2,000 years ago in Palestine, the ground was plowed as the seed was sown. Mm -hmm. Jesus' point was that the Holy Spirit had plowed and continued to plow every heart, every heart that heard his message of the kingdom of God. The hearers were responding with one of four preparations of the heart. Again, three fruitful, three unfruitful rather, and one fruitful. A clue to Jesus' intended meaning lies in the first three words of Matthew's account that same day. Jesus had taught in riddle form that the only way to find oneself holding a one-way ticket south was to reject or blaspheme the Holy Spirit's movement in his life. So what seed is Christ sowing in your life? Is he prompting you to be, do, or go in a direction that maybe you're resisting? Have you... Um, thought about whether your heart is soft or whether you could be resisting uh, his movement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I would say I've thought about that. Um, the, the day I left Blackhawk, um, I told Shirley, we were talking earlier, um, that next day I woke up at 4.30. Couldn't sleep, have woken up at 4.30 every day since. And there's just a lot going on as you think through what this is going to look like and you talk with different organizations and you're going to, are you going to move your family? Are you going to stay? Are you going to be involved in not-for-profit? Are you going to stay in the church? Are you going to do corporate stuff? It just, there's a lot there. And so, yeah, there's, a, there's the human element of just fear yeah. and uncertainty. Uh, and even though things begin to come together, you, you still aren't sleeping until, you know, it's all dialed in. Here's the, I think the thought I have, even as Curtis read that, and as I've looked at, as we've looked at this parable for, you know, years, I've always been intrigued by the math of that parable. And the math of the parable, if you look at it again, is that with the seed that gets sown, 25% of the time, it works. You know, 75% of the time, according to that parable, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And so I've just been challenged in my own life and in my own heart, you know, in recent years. There's a guy who has invested in me and talked to me about this very thing. And, you know, when you start trying to figure out, so what do we do with 25%, what's the answer? I think the answer <laughs> is more seed. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that complicated. I just think we have to throw more seed. Keep sowing the seed. I think we have to keep sowing seed. Come on, now. seed, more seed, more seed than we're throwing. If you throwing seed and me throwing seed equals 25%, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. So to your question, I think about all the seed I've sown in the last yeah. 25 years yeah. of ministry sort of inside the four walls. Uh, I don't think I'll ever stop doing that. Well, wherever I get a paycheck, I, I love the church and I'm going to do all I can to help seed get sown in that setting. But all of a sudden now I'm realizing I think there's lots of opportunities yeah. for me outside of that yeah. to, to do this. And I want to do that. Yeah. You know me. I yeah, want to I do, do that mm -hmm. well. I want to sow seed and give the gospel as much of an opportunity as possible. Amen. Well, Curtis, could you read Matthew uh, 13, 4 through 7? And then I'm going to have you jump down to his explanation 18 to 22. So four through seven first. Okay. Four through seven. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. Now, could you jump down to 18 and read verses 18 to 22, and he explains it a bit. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. 
the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or, pers or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And on the one whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Oh, this is good. A rabbi would tell a parable because listeners' hearts were already hard, uh, Jesus said. And so he would tell the parable to twist their minds and they would walk away and think about it because if he just presented the truth, uh, you know, just straight factual sentences, he said, they'll just walk away and reject it. He said, but I tell them a parable so they're going to wrestle with it. Mm -hmm. And he said, and they might, they might turn to me. Um, so we're, we get to drop in where he actually, and a rabbi would do this, explain the parable more to his disciples. And we get to see this. It's really cool. So we're going to look at a hard heart, a shallow heart, and a thorny heart. Okay? Uh, a hard heart, the first soil that was received was along the path, and the soil was hard. It had been beaten down and compacted from the travelers who had walked on it. The result was no germination of the seed because the birds came and ate it up. In his explanation of the parable, Jesus equated this earthly truth with the spiritual one. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away that was sown in his heart, that, uh, what was sown in his heart. And this is the seed along the path. Because we often hold on to an experience where someone has walked all over us, our hearts become hard or closed. And the result is that we did not even understand. We do not even understand Christ is sowing, what Christ is sowing in our lives. And the evil one snatches it away. Uh, you've seen this as you preach. You know, uh, Somebody comes in with a hard heart and they just didn't, re you know, boom, they, they're gone because they've been walked all over in their previous life. Uh, so the evil one snatches away Christ's seed that was sown in our hearts, hearts that were plowed or prepared by the Holy Spirit, but actually hardened or closed by us, according to Psalm 17.10. So, you know, if anyone's watching today, uh, if you've hardened your heart to Christ's seed in a particular area of your life, so what you said, open your heart to a spirit who will plow your heart and sow a seed in you, then sow that same seed in others experiencing the fruit that God has for your life. Other lives that are fruitful because of him. Uh, we've seen hard hearts. It's pretty obvious. A shallow heart, these are getting in, more interesting as we go, uh, more complicated maybe. The, the second soil that received the seed was on rocky places where it didn't have much soil, so the soil was shallow. The result was a quick but short-lasting germination of the seed. It sprang up quickly, he said, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Jesus equated this earthly truth with the spiritual. He said, the one who received the seed that fell on the rocky places is a man who hears the word at once, receives it with joy, but since he has no root, he, lusts, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. I, I uh, said lust instead of last because I was thinking that's kind of what happens. Um, there's a, we're going to see more in the thorny heart, but it's shallow. And, and when tests and trials come, you know, we never got discipled and we're going to uh, go a different direction. Um, I think we oftentimes try to apply something that we learn from the Bible, but when it doesn't seem to work and someone mocks us for trying, we quit. Uh, the lack of endurance is a result of no root. We attempted to forgive, we attempted to be wise, we attempted to serve, we attempted to repent, but it really wasn't rooted in our hearts to do so. And we've seen that. I think the first person I prayed with at Black Hawk to surrender his life to Christ, I didn't get, by, I didn't get uh, discipled. Right. And that ended up being kind of a shallow heart. Uh, I think we finally got it corrected, but I, I, I had made my determination then, I will never have spiritual malpractice like that occur again. <laughs> I got everybody discipled. So if you have a rocky place in your heart where you're shallow, grow. Allow the Holy Spirit to plow out the rocks and Christ's seed to take root. Seek God with all your heart, like Jeremiah says in 29, 13. Maybe read a book in the Bible that applies to your area of life where you want to grow. If it's wisdom, read Proverbs. If it's joy, read Philippians. If it's obedience, read 1 John. But now we're going to talk about Mitch's heart a little bit. <laughs> Can I be transparent? Absolutely. And that's a, a thorny heart. Um, Jesus said, among the thorns, and it 
what happened was that the thorns grew up and choked the plants. And Jesus said, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is a man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Because of past experiences, we often uh, will react with a thorny heart. We hold on to the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of, of wealth. We worry about everything from how to pay our bills to what our friends think about us. We fall prey to the deceitfulness of wealth. And you get me, and you know I, I believe this, wealth is not evil. But it can be deceitful because we think that it promises satisfaction when in the end we are left dissatisfied. It will never satisfy. Mark's account of the same story recorded Jesus describing a thorny heart that I think would resemble what happened to me, and that is the desires for other things. Desires for other things. The result is that our attempt to satisfy our desires for other things chokes out the expression of Christ in our hearts and lives. And that's what happened to me. I mean, I got sold out to the almighty dollar. I grew up a Christian kid, was saved at nine, uh, grew up in a great church, went three times a week, but 10 years in the marketplace, and man, I was Lord of my life, and I had the uh, worries about the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things. And um, I just think what we need to understand here, if that happens, we need to let go, and that's what happened to me. I had everything stripped from me, <laughs> and ironically that it was no longer worth anything with my business, I decided to let go. And God transformed things in a mighty way. So we need to allow the Holy Spirit to plow out the thorns of worries of this life for the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things. Let go and return to Christ with all our hearts, like Joel uh, 2.12 says, Christ's seed will take root, bearing the fruit of changed lives. But there's one fruitful soil. Curtis, could you read Matthew 13, 8 through 9? Yep. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a thunderfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then could you read 23, where Jesus dis, uh, explains it all to his disciples? Yep. And on the one whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some, a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Did I say thunderfold the first you time? You did. Yeah, it's the whole, it's the whole you getting old, being a weatherman when you're 85. I, I was just not going to say anything. As soon as I read it the second time, I thought, I, thought, I think I said thunderfold. All right, there, there he goes trying to get the weather and the, everything. Now look, I like that as a cool word. Thunderfold, I know. I think that could be your new thing among all these young people who are following hashtag, you. Hashtag, hashtag, hashtag thunderfold. thunderfold. And I challenge you, I, I beseech you to use it in the forecast tonight. You have to. Somehow figure out a way to Out get of it. the pride of not reading my, uh, not using my readers comes a new word that could become a new hashtag craze. God can break through anything, Curtis. That's right. <laughs> my prideful heart in Thunderfold. I will be watching you. <laughs> yes, we'll be watching for that, Curtis. Um, good. <laughs> so the fourth soil was thunderfold. What is it? Thunderfold? thunderfold. I like that. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. It was good. <laughs> Soft, and the result was blessed. It produced a crop 160, 30 times what was sown thunderfold. 160, 30 thing's cool, too. It is. It really is. I think some people think they've got to be, it just, yeah, it's different. It's 160, it's It goes 30. back to giving it to God and yep. not trying to do it yourself. Yep. Um, Jesus equated this earthly truth with the spiritual one, but the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word, understands it, and he produces a crop yielding, you know, a lot more. Yep. A uh, soft heart is open to the seed that Christ sows. Luke's account of the same parable, he, he would say noble mm -hmm. for the description of a soft, open heart. And uh, it's interesting that Jesus gave three characteristics of that soft heart, uh, of that soft soil. He hears the word, he understands the word, and he produces much fruit, which is changed lives. So if your heart is soft, go. Hear the expression of Christ, understand his message through the Holy Spirit's discerning. This isn't religion, it's a relationship. And produce the fruit of changed lives that God has in store for you in Christ. I mean, I really wanna challenge you. It might make you uncomfortable, but are there changed lives around you? Now, it might be much more than you think, and it might be by your walk more than your talk, 
but I think you gotta, you got to ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. Paul says this, and that, hey, God, are there changed lives around me? Am I, do I really have a soft heart towards you? Have I heard, understand the expression of Christ in me? And am, am I producing, uh, being part of your producing changed lives? Um, if, you're, if your heart is soft, go. Um, Jesus taught in parables so that regardless of one's heart condition, as we talked about, he would, he would have the opportunity for that seed to germinate. And um, Jesus was very clear about why he did that. And I think we need to be wise in the way we communicate as well so that people can see that their hearts have been plowed by the Holy Spirit. And they can uh, respond to a soft heart. I think the whole point here is whether inside our hearts the, it's beaten up and hard because it's been walked on by other people, whether it's shallow, uh, if there's a spot in our heart where it's thorny and the desire for other things is getting us, is that we would surrender that to the sower, yeah. Yeah. allow the Spirit to soften our hearts. Um, I wrote this poem and uh, shared it at my grandfather's funeral when I uh, taught on this message. And it's a sower's prayer. When my heart is hard, help me to sow. Where my heart is shallow, help me to grow. Whatever my heart's thorns, help me let go. And the sower answers. Listen to me speak, I knock at your door. Seek me, find me, I will give you more. Loosen your grip, return to me, I will restore. When your heart is open, into your life, holy rain, I will pour. That's awesome. That's good. Thanks for being with us, and thank you so much for joining us on the Restoration Road. Be sure to get your worksheet online, and you can go through this and, and, and hear these incredible insights of the people that I have with me uh, in your small group, in your life group, in your church, even on your own, and allow God to soften your heart toward Him and be used by Him to help soften the hearts of others. You know, every week I write a devotional and we send it out to our subscribers. And I try to teach the Bible in a relevant way in order to help others connect with Christ. And so if you'd like to be part of that subscription list, just go to our website, therestorationroad.com and sign up for our weekly devotionals. Thank you so much for being part of God's restoration of our culture.